Hello class, welcome to the lecture for this week. Excited to, to dive into the material. This week we are going to be tackling a very interesting question. I talked about this a little bit um, in the introduction to the course, but we're going to be trying to tackle the question of what is a Jew? Um, because this class is an introduction to Judaism, that's obviously the, the first place to start, is to talk about what it means to be Jewish, who are the Jews, um, and we're going to tackle some of that in the readings for the week as well. So, the purpose of this lecture is to try to identify some of the key components to what makes up the Jewish religion and the Jewish people um, as they pertain to that religion. So, let's dive in. The, te- the lecture is officially titled, Jewish Belief, Identity, and Cosmology, Tanakh, Torah, and the Creation. We will understand what those terms mean by the end of this lecture. So, um, first of all, one of the things that's central to Judaism is that Judaism is almost without argument a religion of uh, the written word. And that may seem obvious, um, and to, to those of us that, that you know, among, among us who are Christians or who are Jews, we have written documents, we have scriptures, etc. Um, but, you know, not all religions worldwide would be considered sort of a, a documented, documentary, written religion necessarily that, that harkens back regularly and um, authoritatively to the written word, but that certainly describes Judaism. Obviously, we're very familiar with the concept of the Bible, living here in the United States, and the pivotal role that the Bible has had in the development of the religious um, kind of milieu that, uh, that makes up American religion. Um, and the Bible is very central to Judaism as well. Uh, they have a slightly different Bible, and I'll talk about kind of what, what makes up the, the Bible that is central to Jews. Um, the Bible is basically the Christian Old Testament. The Old Testament, as we know from, uh, from Genesis to Malachi, um, is essentially the Hebrew Bible. Now, that's broken into three different parts in the Hebrew Bible. First of all, the Torah, which is the first five books of Moses. It's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. After that, we have the Nevi'im, which basically in Hebrew means the prophets. And this is broken into um, the various books of of Scripture within the Bible that are written by the prophets, major and minor prophets. And we'll talk more about prophets throughout the semester and their role in Judaism historically. Um, But these are like, uh, for example, Joshua, Judges, um, Isaiah, Jonah, writings of the prophets. Um, and then you have the Ketuvim, which are, are various writings within the scriptures themselves, within, within the, uh, the Old Testament, that are not necessarily prophetic writings, they're not necessarily legal writings, um, but they're writings such as the Psalms and the Proverbs and the Song of Songs and Esther and Daniel. Um, these, these kind of represent not sort of the prophetic books, um, but more kind of devotional writings that, that make up uh, a part of the scriptures. And as you see... Um, T for Torah, N for Nevi'im, and K for Ketuvim, you have the acronym TNK, which is basically the Hebrew name for the Bible, the Tanakh. Just, you see we've just added some, some vowels in here. Um, and and that, that's basically what the, the Bible is. It's the Tanakh. It's the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim. So the legal writings, the writings of the prophets, and various other writings um, that, uh, that make up the, the Tanakh. So this is central to Judaism and has been basically um, as these texts were being written and certainly is a central part of the Jewish religion and what makes uh, Jews identify um, as Jews and, and is this, this particular, you know, uh, identifying with the Bible and the, the biblical narrative and writings. You know, it's interesting, even a lot of Jews that aren't religious in nature um, and we'll talk more about this throughout the semester, such as the is, Israeli, the, the foundation of the state of Israel was much less religious than you might think. You might think that it was, um, you know, founded by uh, really pious and orthodox Jews, and they certainly had a role. There was still certainly a role um, that, the, that the religion, as it was being practiced outside, had, had to play. But Israel was largely founded by secular Jews, non-religious Jews, Jews that had come from Russia that were part of the uh, socialist 
uh, situation going on there. And, there, that, and that's why Israel, from its foundations, had a very kind of socialistic flavor to it in, near the beginning. Um, and we'll understand that quite a bit more. Israel being the modern nation state, which began in 1948. Um, but anyways, uh, what I was saying is that even those secular Jews still identify with the Bible because the, the Bible represents uh, sort of a history book for them, a history of their people. And so um, even those that aren't necessarily religious, maybe those that don't even believe in God, can have some identity and some connection with the biblical narrative. All right, uh, the Torah is probably the most important part of the Tanakh for Jews. It's, it's basically the law. Now, we will understand throughout the semester, and this is an interesting point of the question of what is a Jew, that there are various ways that Jews throughout the world practice their faith, that practice Judaism. It doesn't look the same in every synagogue, in every temple throughout the United States, throughout Europe, throughout China, throughout South America. Um, there are various ways in which Jews manifest their Judaism. And we'll talk about some very specific types of, of uh, Jewish practice and some designations of Judaism, such as Reform Judaism, Conservative Judaism, Orthodox, um, Reconstructionist. There's Messianic Judaism, which is, is almost like a melding of Christianity and Judaism. Um, and, you know, those of you that are familiar with the biblical narrative, um, and in, in specific the New Testament, you see a lot of the different branches of Judaism coming out of the New Testament. You, you hear about the, the Pharisees, you hear about the Sadducees, about the Essenes, the Zealots. Um, there's a lot of different groups, even um, during that period of Judaism. So this is kind of a central part of what it means to be a Jew. It's, it's almost that there's a lot of different answers to that question, and it depends on who you are, and it depends on what your motivations are for asking that question. And I think we'll understand a little bit more as we go throughout the readings to that, that particular point. Um, but by and large, the law is important to all Jews. Um, now, various Jews will practice it in different ways. You may know some Reformed Jews that um, don't live the kosher laws, that don't you know, abstain from certain things that other Jews do that are, that are Orthodox. Um, it's just various choices to, to adhere to the law in various ways. But by and large, the Torah is the has historically been probably the most important book of Scripture for the Jews. And again, that's made up of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Exodus through Deuteronomy makes up the actual law itself. That's where Moses receives the law, um, Moses being kind of the, the principal and initial and, and most uh, significant prophet of Judaism, uh, the law receiver who received the law from, from God directly. And we'll talk a lot more about Moses and about the covenant aspect of Judaism that is an important part of the Jewish faith as well. This covenant meaning a relationship, a connection to God. Now that really is an important part of Judaism is that what we're talking about is how a particular people dev defines itself in connection with God. And really that's, that's kind of the definition of, of a lot of religions in and of themselves is how people identify with God, how they see God, how they envision him or her, and how they, how they identify with that, that entity. So um, the Torah is an, an important part to it. And I want to talk for a moment about Genesis. So some people, there's been this question, and, and Judaism is very much a, a religion of debate, um, of, of back and forth, of, of um, disputation, of you know, discourse back and forth, and coming up with a consensus answer that represents the truth. Um, and there's been question of why is Genesis included in the Torah if the purpose of the Torah is to establish the law? Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. What is the purpose of Genesis? Because those of you that are familiar with the Bible are familiar with the fact that Genesis is, is a narrative. It's a story. It tells the story of the development of um, basically the people of God from the very beginning until um, basically they, they arrive in the promised land. And so why is Genesis included? Let's talk about that for just a second. There's um, an, uh, one idea is, is that there are some laws, and uh, here I use the Hebrew word, the mitzvah, or mitzvot, which is plural. 
some laws that can be extrapolated from Genesis, even though it's just a narrative. And one example is Exodus 12. And this is uh, the concept of Rosh Hodesh, which is basically means the head of, Rosh is, 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 means head. So the head or the beginning of the month, um, of the moon, basically. So, so the, the start of a new moon, which is basically seen as a commandment from God to the Jews to create a calendar. Basically, the first mitzvah to Israel is to create a calendar. And the Jews have a lunar calendar um, that they, you know, that they use that, uh, that is, is always uh, off a little bit from, from the solar calendar that we use. Um, but that means that, uh, you know, the Jewish holidays will fall on different days throughout the year than, than normal. Uh, than you know than the day be- the year before because the lunar calendar operates slightly different than the the um, solar calendar. So this was the first mitzvah, and that's one of the one of the arguments is that Genesis was included to um, to basically provide the first commandment, and that's why it's part of the Torah. Now there's another argument, and that's uh, from Rashi, who is an, a very significant Jewish thinker during the 11th and 12th century. Um, and he basically says that the reason that Genesis exists is basically, um, without you know being blasphemous or anything like that, it's uh, basically God's resume, sort of. It's it's the explanation of why God has a claim on Israel, on these people. Why is God worthy of being worshipped and being followed? And so the story of Genesis shows how God, you know. Um, creates the the universe, creates the world, how he creates man and women, and how he uh, provides for them, and how he, you know, provides the law, and he provides expectations and standards, and and what his relationship is with them, how you know the Israelites are in bondage in Egypt, and how he uh, frees them from that bondage through Moses. Um, all of these things lead up to the law, and demonstrate why God is mighty. And we'll talk a little bit more in the semester about um, the monotheistic nature of, of Judaism. Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people sort of take it completely for granted that Judaism is and has always been a monotheistic faith, meaning that Judaism professes to believe in one, one God. But there's actually evidence, and I'm not saying this is necessarily my opinion, but there's evidence and uh, scholars that believe that Judaism in the very beginning, the Jews, represents more, not necessarily a polytheistic faith, in that they believed in many gods, but what is called a henotheistic, in the sense that they believed in one god being pow- more powerful and prominent than the rest of the gods. Because the, the Bible throughout the, the beginning especially talks about other gods, it acknowledges the fact that there are other peoples who believe in other gods. Even the Ten Commandments themselves say that God commands the people to believe in Him, to worship Him and none other. And the argument is that that reference means that there are other gods that could potentially be worshipped, but that the Jewish God is the most powerful of all. Now, whether or not this was um, an actual way that, that Jews viewed themselves in the very beginning as kind of choosing one God over others, it is really kind of flushed out by the second, before the second temple period, which is the period in which Jesus of Nazareth lived. Um, and by that time, it seems very clear that the Jews believed that there was one legitimate God and no other gods, and all other gods were false. So let's talk a little bit about cosmology. Um, cosmology is, is kind of a, a little bit like this, the, the intersection of science and religion. It's, it talks about kind of the, the Genesis pers- in the sense that Genesis meaning the beginning. Um, how did things begin? How, how, were, um, you know, how was the universe created? Um, it's a very complicated question and religions have various answers for this. Now, in the Jewish faith, there are two primary concept of cosmology. There's two different models. There's the Logos model and the Aegon model. We'll talk about both. The Logos model is the one that you're probably most likely familiar with, and that is the the model of the word. Logos meaning word. And this is basically the model. Let me get to that. uh, The divine speech model where the Lord speaks and the world comes into fruition. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and with the breath of his mouth, all their host. Psalms 33, 6. This is the idea that God, through his power, spoke 
and the world came into into fruition. Um, various things happening on various days or creative periods, as is depicted in Genesis chapter 1. So this is the idea um, that God had the existing power to create the world. He spoke and the world came into existence. Now there's another slightly more hidden um, concept of cosmology that is found in the Bible, but it's not necessarily part of the Genesis narrative. It's an idea that God actually had to engage in divine battle to, pr to prove his premacy. Now, this is the concept of the, you know, the cosmology of divine battle. But God is my king from time in memoriam who works salvation in the midst of the earth. You crumbled the sea with your might. You shattered the heads of the sea, monsters on the water. You crushed the heads of Leviathan. You give it as food to the people and companies. Now, Leviathan is this concept of this primordial power that exists on the earth, essentially, you're in the universe before God's rise to premacy. And that he had to actually suspend or neutralize these other powers and demonstrate his legitimacy. And by doing so, he gained control over the elements, gained control over uh, the created powers. And the only reason that he could do that is because he proved that he was mightier than, than all. So... Um, you know, there's various ways to interpret these two things, and you may even come up, you know, and some have come up with interpretations that include concepts of both, um, but, you know, even even the Genesis concept talks about God going on the waters and there being, um, you know, these, these pre-existing primordial waters that seem to exist before creation exists, and, um, you know, th that could be sort of a reference to this concept of the battle against Leviathan. Here is a depiction by... Uh, an 18th century um, artist depicting the destruction of Leviathan and, and God coming down with, with power and with great um, you know, majesty to destroy Leviathan and establish his premacy. All right, so let's talk for a second um, to end this lecture just about the concept of what it means to be a Jew. We've talked about a few things that are important to Judaism. We've talked about the scriptural narrative, uh, the Torah, um, you know, the, the connection that Jews have with God, that that's an important part of, of what it means to be a Jew. But almost unlike any other, ent any other group of people in the world, this, this question gets complicated. Um, it, are Jews a political movement? Are they a national movement? You know, does Israel represent what it means to be a Jew, to, to identify yourself with a particular political um, nation state? Um, you know, that's easy to see now, but, you know, what about anciently, when the kingdom of Israel existed in the biblical time? Was that a necessary part of being a Jew, being aligned or being a part of that kingdom? Uh, were the Jews or the people that professed the same things that lived outside of the kingdom any less Jewish or any more Jewish? Um, that, these are, these are the, the important questions that we'll be tackling throughout the semester. Is it a religious movement is it uh, is to be a Jew is is being a Jew synonymous with Judaism if you stop professing Judaism are you still a Jew that is a very hard question and a lot of people have different answers to that in fact some of the reading that you have for this week I believe will address that a particular instance in which you know a, a prominent Jew converted to Christianity and still wanted to you know, identify as Jewish with respect to Israel and the ability to settle in Israel. And the question came up as whether or not that person was still a Jew or if because they had pronounced, they had renounced the religion, were they no longer Jewish? Is being Judea, Jewish an ethnicity? You know, is it because your, your parents were Jewish, your mother was Jewish, your family was Jewish, going all the way back to the Hebrew people that populated the land of Israel? Um, that's, that's another aspect of what it means to be Jewish, but is that the only aspect? Um, you know, are all three of these required, or two of these required? Um, there's no good answer, and that's the exciting thing about studying this, is that um, there's different ways to interpret this. And let me just give you a couple of examples, and some anecdotal examples. Um, the right of return is a concept that is created in the land of Israel, which basically allows Jews to come back to the land of Israel um, to the nation state of Israel. So this is a modern concept um, and basically become an automatic citizen, um, be taught the Hebrew language, be given assistance in finding a place to live 
and finding employment, given free passage from your, your former country. Um, this is something that a right that belongs to all Jews worldwide. And by the end of the semester, you'll understand a little bit more about the worldwide concept of Judaism and where Jews um, came from, you know, how, when they spread out from Israel, where they went, and basically how they were brought back to Israel, and what Jews are still, you know, living and existing throughout the world. And we'll see in some of the readings for this week as well, talk, demonstrate kind of the, 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 the vast kind of dispersion of Jews throughout the world. But the concept of the right of the return ends up becoming very political. Um, you know, Jews, and this, this ties really in, I can't, I can't explain everything without explaining the, the kind of the foundation of the, of the Arab-Palestinian-Israeli conflict, and we will get to that in one of our modules. But the idea did is basically that the, the, the Israelis have a motivation to have more Jews come, because Jews... Are actually have have a lower fertility rate than the Arab populations that live in the land of Israel and around around the state of Israel and the occupied territories, and so it's it behooves the Jews to have more Jews come in from outside through migration, so they can kind of keep up their their um, the, the proportion uh, their majority in the state of Israel. You know, but, but what happens is, as most of the Jews that are going to migrate have already migrated, and the Jews aren't experiencing as much migration. Well, there was a group of Jews in the 90s that were basically African Jews in Ethiopia who claimed that they came from a line that came directly from, from King Solomon, um, one of the original Jewish kings, and that they had been professing and practicing Judaism ever since. Now, this was an African people that, um, you know, were not sort of, uh, you know, lighter skinned necessarily. They, they were, were African people. They, they looked almost undistinguishable from other African sects and, and races. And so the question is, are they Jews? Well, you know, a lot of people think that the motivation for accepting them as Jews um, that was that was basically made by the Israeli Supreme Court was that Israel needed more Jews to come, and therefore at that point they were willing to extend the designation of Jews to these people, whereas previously they would not have been able to, or been willing to, and so they did extend that, and they had a massive major migration from Ethiopia of these um, Ethiopian Jews. Are they ethnically? Are they religious? Are they national? See, it gets back to these questions, and it's complicated, but. It's a decision made by Israel that we are going to extend the definition. Now, historically and religiously, the definition of a Jew is if your mother was Jewish, then you are considered Jewish by the law. And you'll, you'll get some of that in the reading as well. But when the Nazis, when the Third Reich was analyzing what they saw to be the Jewish problem, they actually redefined what it meant to be Jewish and took it back to the grandparent. And so anybody that had... It was something along the lines of like 14%, you know, uh, Jewish uh, connection through a grandparent was considered a Jew. So all of a sudden, the definition of Judaism, as changed and altered by, by the Nazis, extended it far beyond what it was before. And now a lot more people were considered Jew that wouldn't have been considered Jews before. And so again, you see the question of what does it mean to be a Jew suddenly changed in a very dramatic and significant way for those particular individuals because many of those were ones that were targeted in the Holocaust, whereas if a different definition had been used, certain individuals would not have been targeted. So, again, I just I don't want you to come away more confused um, from this lecture. The reality is that there are a lot of different answers to this. Now, it's not that far flung from what we're more familiar with. Let's say, I, I assume that most of us that are taking this class are American citizens. And ask yourself, what does it mean to be American? Now, there is, there is not a hard, an easy answer to that. And a lot of people will have different answers to that as well. And so that hopefully is a parallel to help us understand that there's a lot of answers to this question of what it means to be Jewish. 
and a lot of people that have different motivations. In the instance of Israel, they wanted to expand the definition so that they could have more Jews in the nation itself. And with the respect to the Nazis, they wanted to expand the definition so that they could weed out basically anybody that had any connection to the Hebrew blood. So, anyways, that's the end of this lecture for this, this week. We will talk um, a lot more throughout the semester about this idea, and we'll be coming back to this theme throughout of what does it mean to be Jewish. So think about that as you do the readings. Think about that as you think about what you know about Judaism, and take that question with you throughout the semester. And a lot of what we'll talk about will, will make sense, and you'll gain a deeper understanding to this question, and hopefully be able to... to um, understand the nuances of what it makes it such a fascinating question by the end of the semester. All right, have a great week.